the Escalette collection. And um, at some point over this semester, I invite you to see a vet's work and that of the Veteran Print Project in Argus Forum on the second floor. So um, Yvette is a printmaker who um, currently works at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum in Madison. Um, she's also a veteran. She served for eight years, was deployed overseas twice. Um, she was an artist with the army, but also we just learned she was a cook, first of all, <laughs> with the army. <laughs> she has many, many talents and we keep learning, keep learning of them. So, um, her goal with the Veteran Print Project is to communicate the veteran experience through art, um, to give a voice to the veteran experience. Um, and she uh, is particularly interested in giving a voice to the, the diversity of the veteran experience, to veteran women, to Latinx veterans, um, to raising the visibility of, of just how diverse the military um, currently is. So uh, w our collection, the Escalette, recently uh, bought a portfolio of 36 prints uh, from the print project. So they're now part of the permanent collection that we have here at Chapman. And um, we will be putting some on permanent display in Roosevelt uh, after our current exhibit closes. So that's very exciting. So um, I'd like to thank Andy Harmon and the Center for American War Letters for helping with this uh, event, um, Leatherby Libraries, and of course, um, our Wilkinson College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. Um, also, a huge thank you to our own Jessica Basinski, our registrar there. Um, also, our students, Haley Teves and um, Henry Littleworth, and Claire True. So um, please join me in welcoming Yvette. Okay, I'm really short, so I'm gonna. Um, thank you guys for being here today. Um, I have a kind of a list of thank yous I wanna start with, but um, also ask some early forgiveness. I'm just getting over a two week flu, so my voice, I have a nice little convoy of cough drops up here and I have water and I have tea, so we should be good. Um, but if you have any time trouble hearing me, just let me know and I'll speak louder. Um, but right now I'm gonna use my indoor sergeant voice and it's always really interesting using a microphone in a small space, but I think we'll be okay. So first of all, um, you know, my name's Yvette Pino, as Lindsay said. Um, Thank you for sharing your evening with me. I know that you all have very busy schedules, so I am really honored to be here. I wanna thank Lindsay and Jessica for not only inviting me here, I mean, it is a privilege to speak, but as you mentioned, um, the acquisition of the Veteran Print Project prints is a in really incredible feat for the Veteran Print Project. In May, we're gonna be celebrating our 10-year anniversary of the project. Um, and today is actually a special day, which I haven't shared with the two of you, on February 26, 2002, I left for basic training 18 years ago today. So um, when I realized that today was that special anniversary, I thought it was fitting. We're 10 years um, celebrating our 10-year anniversary of the Veteran Print Project and 18 years since I swore myself to the United States Army. Um, but um, one of the things that makes it such a privilege to have the Veteran Print Project prints, and I'll explain a little bit about the prints, so I won't leave you in the dark about that, but to have them as part of the acquisition of this collection um, is that when we first started our conversations, um, you shared with me information about the collection, um, and I was able to do some research about where the prints would go. Um, because it's really important for me to have these works of art be on exhibit to foster and further conversation. And that is the value of this collection, that it embraces that sentiment. I love the idea of a museum without walls, that artwork is visible to public and the student body in an effort to engage conversation. It's also placed in areas <clears throat> where artists who are often underrepresented can have their work seen and can be made visible through this collection. Doing even more research, realizing that Mr. Escalette was an Army veteran. So that is a privilege to be a part of this collection. Um, in an effort to share the prints, I am also really proud to say that several of my prints in the body of work were selected. 
So as a woman of color, as a veteran, um, yes, I check a lot of diversity boxes, but it's really heartwarming to know. Um, we've had many discussions over the last few weeks, but not only with Chapman University, but with other colleagues in my field, that many institutions talk the talk about expanding diversity, making sure underrepresented communities are <clears throat> visualized, but very few are actually, unfortunately, walking the walk. And so to be a part of that effort, I'm really honored. <clears throat> so um, thank you. And thank you for the Center for American War Letters um, to host this. Um, I'm looking forward to many new collaborations with them. Um, I love letter writing. It was a very big part of my veteran experience. So I think it tells our stories um, really well. <clears throat> and forgive me, the cough drop seems to be making me shake. I'm really not that nervous. <laughs> um, um, so before I begin and tell you a little bit about the print project, um, we were in conversation yesterday at lunch and I, I mentioned a part of the story that I was gonna edit out of this, but I think it's, it's worth sharing that a few years ago, um, I went to the World War II Museum for the first time in New Orleans and um, it was at the time a fairly new museum and I went in and I experienced this moment where for the first time in my post-military career, I felt really invisible. I wasn't in uniform, um, people didn't know that I was a veteran, and I felt like entering that institution, I, for some reason, really wanted people to know I was a veteran. And then when I got to the ticket counter, there was a sign that said, he paid for our service, let's pay for his visit. And I had just met several of the most amazing women <clears throat> I, I still have met in Wisconsin, I was introduced to several women Marines who served in World War II. Connie was an air traffic controller in Cherry Point. Annette was a P-52 mechanic in San Diego. Um, you name it. Um, recently, we just met Mrs. Anna Mae Robinson, who was part of the first African-American all-female postal unit in World War II. And so for that moment where I personally felt invisible, I thought, he paid for our freedom, let's pay for his visit. How a simple use of a pronoun can <clears throat> negate somebody's entire experience, right? And in today's society, we're really thinking about that. We're really thinking about how we communicate identity and experience, and pronoun usage is one of them. But in that moment, I felt really distraught over the fact that these women weren't having a voice. They've since changed it. So you know, that error has been corrected. But I say that because it's really important that we tell our stories, right? We must tell our stories. Because years down the road, I don't want to walk into a museum and see that my experience has been failed. They failed to tell my own personal experience. Because my experience will be overlooked and it will be forgotten. I also believe that by telling our stories, Veterans have the, offer, the ability to offer the leadership of our nation a well-rounded perspective of the experiences that result from the policies they're creating, they're implementing, they're enforcing. If we tell our stories, they understand the ramifications of the decisions we make, all of us, right? So I think it's, it's nice to offer them that information. Um, so ideally, they'll utilize that information and responsibly put their policies into practice, right? Um, and my story won't be forgotten. It doesn't have to because I have the ability to reject the idea that my story will be forgotten. Not everybody has the ability to tell their story or is in a place to tell their story. So this is an effort to help those communicate the veteran experience. <clears throat> what I hope to bring to this conversation today um, is, you know, a not only a brief overview of some of the artists, the veterans, the participants of the Veteran Print Project, um, but I also want to talk a little bit about my own personal work and some work of the emerging veteran art movement. So a lot of post 9-11 veterans currently working on their craft. Um, but I want to look not only at the work, but how the work itself changes with personal experiences of war. Um, I can offer you a pers my personal point of view as a veteran as a, and as an artist, and 
often when I'm asked to speak and have conversations like we're having today, um, ideas and concepts about veteran art or war on conflict talk about topics like heroism, reintegration, metaphor, uh, the deeper metaphor of the veteran experience in general. Um, but it really is prevalent when we start to think about concepts of identity and illusion. Um, and identity is a big thing in the work of not only our current veterans, but veterans of the past. And I'll get into that in a second. Um, I've been honored to speak about my peers over the last few years, um, but it, I have to admit it's been a daunting task. It's always curious to discuss contemporary work through a critical lens. And the one reassuring component of all of this is that we are here, hopefully, to prompt discourse, right? We wanna have the discussion started. I've spent the last decade um, encouraging dialogue within communities, and I've tried on various fronts to facilitate opportunities for these communities to engage in meaningful conversations. And I want these meaningful conversations to be about a shared human experience, not a shared veteran experience, not a shared artist experience, not about gender, but a shared human experience. And so today, I'm gonna to do my best to offer you first some background information about the work that's being created, and then we'll examine a few examples of the artwork from the Veteran Print Project, hopefully to extend the conversation. Um, and I didn't get a chance to ask those of you, um, do we have any veterans in here today? Thank you. Um, do you mind if I ask where, what branch of service? Okay, well, well thank you. I look forward to maybe talking to you a little bit after and hearing some of your story. Um, we have a lot of uh, women artists in the collection. We did an entire exhibit on 20 Wisconsin women veterans. Um, and I can get into that in a little bit, but uh, it's um, always interesting when we encourage women to tell their stories. It's a little bit more of a difficult path to follow. Um, so the blank, there's a blank screen for a reason. Um, the next question is, um, do we have any artists in here? Artists, great. Um, art history majors? All right, yeah, art history lovers. Um, and that's okay, I'm gonna explain a little bit. So when we get through, if you guys have questions on the methodology of the prints, I'm happy to explain what I mean by a lithograph or a etching or a woodcut. Um, um, and then how many of you remember 9-11? Okay, one of the things I talk about is how my own narrative has changed in the 10 years since I've been out of the military. And one of the biggest realizations is that when I speak to groups, especially at college level, I realize how many people either weren't born at 9 on 9-11 or were very young and don't actually remember it occurring. And a lot of these folks can now serve in that war still. So. It makes the, it changes the conversation a little bit, at least for me. Um, and one of the things when I started this project was there was a disconnect between veterans and civilians. What I'm seeing now is there's now a disconnect between veteran and veteran. Because the war I served in in 2003 is very different than um, those that are serving currently. The cities where I was at are completely different. Um, so that's interesting for me, interviewing other veterans. Um, which is how we're gonna move forward. Because I've been out of the military for 10 years, um, and in the research that I've been doing for our discussion today, and the research I've been doing in the last couple years, specifically since 2018, um, in the centennial celebration of the armistice that ended World War I. Um, starting to do research about the artists in World War I, I realized that there is an extraordinary overlap between the artists in World War I, specifically veteran artists, so um, military service members that served in World War I who were either artists before or um, made work after, and the global war on terror artists, veteran artists. So there's this overlap. And so it, it's really important that I mention the impact that this revelation has had on my invest investigation on the practices of both artists because it has had an extraordinary impact <clears throat> in how I look at society and how I document society and I discuss it. Um, 
As I reviewed and examined historic concepts of World War I, well, existing in the current daily news cycle of our country's um, present climate, um, researching World War I and listening to the news cycle or looking at Facebook or social media, I find a greater responsibility to actually expand my analysis of the work that's being created. And I'm thinking about how we communicate or need to communicate the immediacy of this charge. It's really important that we <clears throat> examine what's happening globally um, and look back to history to um, find a path forward. Um, so if you've got some history, background in art history, maybe some of you have some, maybe if you have some basic history um, background, you might be aware that after World War I, artists um, were desperate to find a visual language that depicted the catastrophic apocalypse that they had just experienced, both as an art, as a victim and as a participant. Um, society was wounded and it was searching for a new identity that was splintered and at times unconscious or at best society was comfortably numb. Um, the resulting artistic era was filled with angled, disconnected fragments in abstracted realities. Surreal images revealed confusing truths of an implausible existence. The rapidly advancing technologies that were seen on the, uh, I almost said on the dance floor, um, the rapidly advancing technologies that were seen on the battlefield um, were presented in societal portraits of humans existing, oops, we want the Oscar um, Auto Dix one here. Um, these were societal portraits of humans existing in um, a complicit detachment of, from humanity. Um, some of them compared it to living in a theater where everybody was playing a role and nobody was engaging with one another. They were looking away. And if you look at this painting um, to the left, our actual. Um, this isn't a really great copy of the Otto Dix painting, but uh, wounded veterans wounded were there um, as society was just kind of in this own theatrical existence and completely detached from the realities of what they had just experienced. Now the armistice would come and it would end World War I and it would give some of these people closure and the artists that would move on would then define what we now know as modernism. Um, in my own personal post-war experience, I began to study this art history, um, and I found myself asking this, why does this genre, why does modernism connect with me so much? And why does it still matter? Um, I'm really fortunate, we have a new director at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum, who's looking at and actually has placed the question before all of us in the staff, as we look at these anniversaries that come up, or commemorative dates, this year is filled with 75th anniversary of World War II um, and VE Day, VJ Day. We just celebrated 75th anniversary of Iwo Jima. Next year is gonna be the 20th anniversary of 9-11. <clears throat> when we look at these dates and we examine them for curatorial purposes from a museum point of view, we need to ask why does it still matter? We can't just place it there for you to read what it was about. We need to discuss why it still matters. And when we look at the commemoration of the end of war with armistice, we have to say, in a state of ongoing war, why does an armistice still matter today, right? So I'm very fortunate that I have a director that's asking this question and posing it. So for me, modernism, why does it still matter? Well, the answer was simple. The artist returning from the global war on terror um, in today's modern society, we're also seeking a new creative language to depict and inform a disconnected society. Rather than abstracted realities and surreal interventions, we are immersing ourselves into our communities to actively engage in a participatory and a very social practice. There's a transformative nature to this process. And so I'm gonna I'm probably ask a couple questions as we go through here, but um, I'm wondering if this transformative process of working with our communities um, can be a metaphor for reintegration. Um, 
So I'll talk a little bit about some of the processes that these artists are doing and explain um, these processes. And I want you to think about transformation as reintegration. Um, you guys all familiar with reintegration coming out of the military and returning to civilian life? Okay. So in, um, in the example of the Veteran Print Project, marks are made on metal, this is etching, dipped into acid, so a chemical alteration provides a void for ink to fill until a piece of paper is pressed into it, sent through a printing press to reveal an image. This is the process of creating multiples of the same thing. In the form of combat paper, rag in the form of military uniforms is being cut down, beaten to a pulp, placed into a vat, scooped up, and pressed into a new sheet of paper. This is the process of deconstruction and reformation. This is Nathan Lewis uh, from Combat Paper giving a workshop at Haystack uh, last May. Um, so it's just a video of him showing you how to pull. That pool of water is filled with pulp. Um, we took military uniforms, cut them down, put them through a, it's called a beater, and so it cuts it up and makes it into pulp, and then you pull it up, and where it resides and the water seeps through will create a piece of paper. In the artists such as Dirty Canteen, um, Aaron Toole, Ash Curie, Jesse Albrecht, the ceramic artists, they're using clay and it's kneaded and it's folded. It's of earth, metal, and water and it's created into a form. It's exposed to high temperatures and allowing it to harden, thus it's strengthened. So in order for the clay to become strengthened, it's got to go through the fire. And I'm showing, this is the process of malleable fortitude. This is Josh Zeiss, an Iraq artist, ceramic artist out of um, North Dakota. I brought him to Madison. Those little forks there are the forks that you search for IEDs in, in improvised explosive devices. He puts them all on the wall, and I'm sorry I turned the video, but. <laughs> um, and then he creates these organic forms on a wheel and then he was a medic, so he takes an endotracheal tube, shoves it into the clay form, and removes the air from it and deflates it to create these organic forms that sit on this fork. Extremely talented artist. I love this, this man. He's a really great friend of mine. But um, these are what these artists are doing. And I tell you this, that while it's not the Veteran Print Project, this is the work of my colleagues and what we're doing. And when I show you these things, I feel like all of these processes that we're doing are visceral, they're transformative, and yes, they are, um, that's more of Josh's work, um, metaphors for reintegration. <clears throat> but I also feel like all of these processes mimic the military experience. And I can get into that a little bit more later. I wanna keep going, but think about the processes that I just explained to you and how that could mimic what a military experience is. <clears throat> so, I asked you if transformation could be a metaphor for reintegration. Um, reintegration implies that there's a return to something that existed before. Today's veteran artists are revealing that there's an implausibility to that charge. We're seeking a more literal meaning to the word reintegration. Reintegration is, by definition, the act of restoring elements that are disparate to unity. Um, Community immersion, like in what we're doing in all of our projects, recreates the camaraderie of service in an effort to deflect isolation. So the global war on terror artists, we don't have an armistice. In a state of perpetual war, we do not have an opportunity to find closure. Thus, the outcome of our process is transformation and our narrative remains transient. Um, the video you just saw there was me working with the students from the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design on a collaborative uh, relief print. So all, what they were drawing on was birch plywood. They spent the next two weeks carving it, and then we had a steamroller press event where we, we made prints based from those big giant pieces of wood. We used a steamroller as a printing press. Um, so that's been a really um, instrumental part of all of our process is this community engagement. One of the overarching themes that these artists require is an engaged community 
as an integral part of the craft of the shared communal experience. The consistent dictum is to circumvent isolation um, by embracing the collective experience. The work is process bound and it's visceral and it's transformative. Um, so another question, often when I have conversations with folks and I'm asked to speak about veteran art, the number one question we get or statement we get is about healing. Oh, this must have been such a healing process for you. This would be very healing. And I don't mean to say that in a negative tone. I think it's a very valid question. Um, so my question is, should healing be a requirement for transformation? Um, and if it is, I want you to think about who is being healed. Um, we wonder, a lot of us artists have had these conversations, how often civilians think that the veteran is seeking healing um, and my friend Jesse Albrecht puts it best. Um, civilians think veterans are seeking healing, but healings, uh, vet, excuse me, veterans um, are seeking to heal society and not the self. So um, healing, it can be a part of it, but we often have to think about who's being healed or who actually is seeking healing or needs the healing. Um, so for me, I've always wanted to be an artist. I've, I was in great shape there, but <laughs> um, this is me in Iraq in 05. Um, since I was a little kid, when I was five years old, I got a birthday card that had a list of jobs and it said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I checked off artist and then I wrote in book writer because I didn't know the word author. Um, and doesn't matter, it's been a long time, I stand before you, I'm an artist and a storyteller. Um, but as you already know, I'm a veteran, and I was a cook. Um, and I served with the 101st Airborne Division, and I was in General Petraeus' headquarters platoon. Um, I deployed to Iraq in 2003 for a year, and again in 2005 for another year. Um, being a cook allowed me to meet a lot of people because everybody has to eat, which means everybody crossed my threshold at least once a day. And so a lot of stories were told and a lot of stories were heard. And what I realized is people talk about food. People love to discuss food and food, the discussions of food prompts memory. And it gets, you get to know, as a sergeant, it helped me learn my soldiers, where they were raised, what they ate, what they didn't eat. Was there food there? Was there not food there? Who was preparing it? Who was present? Who was absent? You get to know a lot about per people. And I still tell my artists to this day, talk about food. It'll get people to start talking about memories. Um, so during those deployments, I also volunteered to paint a mural. Uh, and that led to the unique experience of becoming the unofficial division artist. Um, which meant I got to keep the paint and anytime they needed something painted, they called me and I had to paint it. So whether it was an artistic task or not, go get Pino, she'll paint it for you. Um, but I got to keep the paint. So considering I didn't have a lot of art, art supplies, it was incredible. Um, I painted many murals, giant helipads like you see here. Those were 30 feet by 60 feet helipads in the middle of the desert. So they were the world's largest sand paintings. Um, I painted Humvees, concrete barriers. Um, I even painted porta potties. Um, I also was asked to design the new unit crest for the 501st STB. Um, and even though that design never came to fruition, I still remember being signaled out by Colonel Chase and my command sergeant major to grab my sketchbook and report to the office for a priority mission. Um, one thing I learned while I was in the Army was that you can paint with an audience. You have to paint with an audience. Um, people loved to come and talk to me when I was painting. Um, and one thing I know too, people love to watch people making art. It's a fascination. They love to talk to you about it. Um, so I was learning about people as a cook. And then when I was out there painting, they came and talked to me. And um, pretty soon they would just come just to talk. They didn't even care about the painting anymore. Um, and I was learning a lot about the people I was serving with. 
and I felt like I belonged to something, um, like I was a valid participant in something that was bigger than myself. Um, I think this is the reason why the Army uses artwork as a morale builder. We all roll our eyes when they say it's for morale and wellness. Well, conversations happen, so I guess in reality it really was, and it made me happy. Um, I had pride in myself and my abilities as an artist and as a soldier. <clears throat> But looking back, I think there was a specific reason that I, reason that I fine tuned my listening skills while I was creating these visual guides for storytelling. Um, when I got out of the military, I went to art school. Um, I did go to culinary school, but that's not important to this story right now. <laughs> but I, I ended up in art school, and I didn't want, um, I no longer, you could see all I was painting were our unit crests and our emblems, and I didn't want to have anything to do with military subject matter. I didn't want that in my artwork. I was distancing myself. I didn't want to have anything to do with veterans affairs. Um, so I said, no military subject matter in my art. That's not what happened. Um, every image I made hinted at my military experience. Um, and if you're in art school, the curriculum for art students requires that the students participate in a critique. Um, and students, young students, um, find this a very difficult part of the process. The intention is to teach the artist how to discuss and defend their work, um, but the young students really would just prepare their work and say, I don't know why I made it. I just did it. It is what it is. Anybody that sat through a young student art critique, that's all you get. It is what it is. Um, or it doesn't mean anything. From my recent experiences, so I'll go back to the slide for a second. From my recent experiences after two deployments, I mean literally starting art school right off of a deployment, I couldn't understand or comprehend how anything, whether it was in your art practice or your personal life, could have no meaning, no intention. Um, so, I began to be very articulate in my analysis of not only my work, but of my peers. Um, I was very generous about my descriptions, um, about my military subject matter, and the result was always the same. At first, everybody was really interested. They wanted to know about the experience. They wanted me to describe it. They wanted me to talk about it. And then soon, um, the interest would lead to exasperation. And I can't talk on behalf of what other people thought, but to me, it felt like they were thinking, oh no, she's gonna talk about it again. Like, here it comes again, right? Like, we're gonna get this story. So, I began to gauge people's facial expressions, and I got this really great talent of knowing who to talk to and who to self-censor, and who to keep my comments to myself. And it was a really great talent. I still have it to this day. Um, but what I found was that while it was a talent, it led to isolation. Um, I got tired of the blank stares and the lack of interest, and it was really frustrating because war was still very prevalent, and it still is today, and so this is still a frustration for me. The, the war was still very real. I had just come back months earlier, um, and it seemed like nobody cared. Um, and I'm not saying they didn't. That's what it felt like. Um, and if they did care, a lot of times it was because they wanted to dance the political rights and wrongs of the war with me. Um, and I struggled with that with for a long time. Um, so I, I got very distraught and I had to find a safe place. And I did that uh, in a student veteran organization on campus. Um, and what I found was all of my fellow student veterans were also experiencing the same isolation. They were also struggling to adapt to the, the new atmosphere that they found themselves in. Um, we had this pre-existing trust with one another. We didn't know each other, but we had this shared experience. So we bonded and we would have conversations. But after a while, I realized these veteran peers were gonna be completely content with spending the rest of their lives only talking about their military experience with other veterans. And as a storyteller, I couldn't handle that. Um, I had to find a way, um, I couldn't think of a life of existing in this isolation, right? And I had to find a way to communicate with my non-veteran peers. Um, it wasn't fair, 
at least I thought it wasn't fair to criticize them for not knowing how to communicate with me or for being ignorant on a certain subject matter. That wasn't fair to them. And the only way to bridge this gap was to open the line of communication, not to shut it down. Um, so I posed the question, um, how can I get veterans to tell their stories? And how can I get artists to depict those stories through a piece of art? Because I communicate best in pictures as an artist. Um, so the Veteran Print Project was born. And the Veteran Print Project's mission is this. Um, we bring to two divergent groups together, veterans and artists, to express the historical experience of veterans through the traditional methods of fine art print, opening an ongoing dialogue between the two. Also, using that dialogue to expand into your communities. Um, let's simplify it. Oh, an artist meets a veteran, a conversation happens, a print is made. I have to tell a quick funny story about this. I had two student interns who were working for me um, and I asked them, their first task was to help me write my first grant for the print project. And so they needed information about the project. This was early on and I was giving them this like, you know, essay of everything I felt. And um, I finally, like at the end of everything, I was just like, really, it's just simple. An artist meets a veteran, a conversation happens, a print is made. And they made this postcard, and that was the essence of the grant, was like, there it is. And I was humbled by that moment, and I still look back. These, the young, the, they're not, well, they're my colleagues now, but they, uh, they've moved on to do incredible things, but uh, they still hold a special place for me in my, in my heart and soul. Um, one of them is a poet, and another is a performance artist artist that's getting his graduate degree this year. So um, anyway, uh, it in the process includes traditional methods of printmaking, which is lithography, etching, relief woodcut, letterpress, screen print. There's more. I don't need to go into all of the processes. But it's not somebody making an image at a computer pressing print and going to Kinko's. That's often misunderstood with non-art communities. So that's why there's the language of traditional methods of fine art print. Um, it's a little snobby of me, but it, it's a lot of work to create these prints. Um, in traditionally, through history, printmaking, artists have used printmaking um, in a way to depict historic moments or like social justice movements. And they do it because printmaking allows you to create multiples and you can distribute them to the masses. Um, for us, we use this format because the multiple allows us to give every participant, the artist, the veteran, the archive, the institution, a copy or a record of his or her experience of this process. Um, originally, it was required that the veteran record an oral history, ideally for an institution like mine at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum, and the artist would receive the recorded audio recording of that oral history and make a print based off of that oral history. And if they could meet the veteran, that was a plus, but it wasn't required. When we moved the print project to Colorado, resources shifted, so it was easier to pair the veteran and the artist to actually just share a cup of coffee and have a conversation, and the oral history was optional. Um, and what we found is the experience was on a much deeper level. The artist could ask questions, they could build a trust, it wasn't just this recorded kind of boring documentation of their life. Um, so we decided that was the best methodology to move forward with this process. Um, we still encourage the oral history, but the thing about oral histories is not everybody's ready to sit down with a microphone and record their story, and nor should they be forced to do that. Even if you think it would be the next best thing for them to do, everybody has a moment when they're ready. But they, they might be okay to sit down with another human being for 20 or 30 minutes and share a cup of coffee. Um, the, um, you know, the result, resulting experience becomes a very personal, shared experience. Um, one thing, I talked about healing earlier. I talked about the question of healing. Um, my goal is not art therapy. I've always been very vocal about this. I actually admire art therapists, but I am not an art therapist. I intentionally chose not to do art therapy. Um, my artists are not qualified art therapists. Um, my goal is not healing, my goal is to get us talking to one another. 
So if healing happens, I'm humbled, I'm grateful, I'm very happy for the person, but um, we want people to talk. And because there's a shared objective of the piece of artwork, I mean, even the print itself is the gift. The, the experience is the conversation. Um, but because there's this piece of art, the focus can be easier to comprehend and the two participants can relax and just share their stories. Um, it's an opportunity to share each other's experiences um, through a visual format. Um, I often ask um, if the veteran should be a participant in the project, like in the creative process. Um, we're not a workshop based where the veteran goes to the studio and works with the artist. That's not what we do. They share a conversation. And part of that is, this is an exercise in trust. We want, it takes a really great deal of trust for a veteran to tell their story in a way that they feel like they're not gonna be misjudged or there's gonna be the inevitable betrayal, right? Like there, there's, there's that fear. And the artist puts a lot of pressure on themselves. And I've participated both as veteran and artist. The artist feels a lot of pressure to get this right, to make sure we capture this person's story. And the way I tell people to calm down is just talk about your own personal experiences. You don't have to have an approval process. I actually think that a lot of that extra engagement about the creative process hinders the, the conversation. So just share a story. Um, as artists, we have a responsibility um, to listen and absorb a person's story and find imagery that's appropriate to capture the dialogue in, a mo in the most honest sense. Um, it can be as simple as picturing a very descriptive event, like one of my veterans told me about carrying a metal tool chest on a deck during a lightning storm because he was the only one that would volunteer to go get this giant piece of metal and carry it through a lightning storm. And that was the one descriptive event I got out of him. Um, you know, or it can be as complicated as doing research to find visual imagery that we don't have in our own personal data bank. You know, uh, I personally value artists that take the time to do ample research uh, to create their work. Um, we don't have the ability to witness somebody else's point of view, right? Like I can't be inside of you and experience your life through your lens. It's, it's impossible. Sometimes I wish I could, but I'm grateful we can't, right? But we do have the ability to discuss another's experience and find common ground. Um, pictures, images, gesture, movement, these are all elements of our existence. Words can be made visual with descriptives and images can be read like words. Um, I'll just kind of sum up really quickly. You know, um, I think about what a blind person sees. This is something that I think about as an artist, as a curator, as you know, somebody that's putting up exhibits in a history museum. How does a blind person see? It's a different ability, right, that must incorporate other senses to define a visual. My mother was also a quadriplegic, so a lot of things we, d we had to give her descriptives to give her something to think about when she could no longer move. So if we approach visual documentation of biography in the same way that a blind person sees uh, or a blind person experiences the world, we might be able to set aside our preconceived notions of what we think other people see. Right, we learn to feel, to touch, to smell, to hear, all of those senses. If we can reach that level of unbiased opinion and allow ourselves to capture our experiences on all levels of sensation, then we might, we might just be able to compose a well-conceived idea, um, which results in an image that maybe, if we're lucky, mimics somebody else's experiences. Right? If we're lucky when these prints succeed, people go, wow, I never saw my story that way. Um, it's just an experience, it's an experience in trust. Right? And I think that's at the essence of what the conversation is, is learning how to talk to each other once again and not be afraid to ask questions or being able to communicate when maybe you feel a question is insensitive or inappropriate, right? Or 
how to steer conversations so that you can have engaging conversation without shutting things down. Um, all of the approach can be literal, it could be abstractions, but the intrinsic qualities remain the same. Tell my artists, decide on their subject, visualize their subject, render the imagery, build on the composition, follow your instincts, and allow creativity and imagination to do their magic. Um, often in debate, we hear, I see what you're saying, but I see it this way. We speak with words, but we hear in pictures, right? So that's why Veteran Print Project is, we see what you're saying. Um, we have a few minutes left. We can talk about the prints. I want to discuss some of the prints. But one of the things that's really amazing about looking at the artwork is, when we did the project in 2012, it was our second project. One of our artist's husbands worked for PBS and came and interviewed the artist and interviewed me. And he asked me, you know, what would be success? Like, how would you de define success of this program? And I said, you know, I hope one day I can be standing against a wall filled with prints, and I will be able to stand there and tell you the story of each veteran and tell you each story um, and what that experience was and a little bit about the veteran. And that would just be amazing to me. And here we are, 10 years later, I have over 100 prints in the collection. We've told over 100 veteran stories with nearly that many artists. Some of our artists are veterans themselves who had to interview another veteran so that they could get a different point of view, um, myself included. I've interviewed multiple branches of service and that has been eye-opening for me to identify my own biases. Um, so I'm here today. We've got some prints. Um, I'll open it up for questions, but then also if you want me to talk about prints, I'm happy to talk about any of the stories you have seen. But thank you. So I think these will keep scrolling. Do we have any questions? Mm-hmm. And I, I love that you started thinking about that because part of your presentation got me thinking about the fact that it's not just about the story. We're not necessarily dealing with the purpose of it. And nor do I think it's about from my reading of, of what you've been telling us about reintegration as a soldier, but perhaps the reintegration of civilian society as a soul. I think just the disconnect you feel right. You started with disconnect. Right. Civilian society is older in this profession than they are. Right. Having had a daily, they, they don't have to do that. Yeah. And I, what I love about this is this, this discussion of reintegrating civilian society <laughs> and Never thought of that. In yeah. some fashion, because we're forced to change. We try right. to change. Right. Um, instead of just shutting someone down, like, oh, this is hard, but we're great, I'm going to move on. And right. Like, no, That's great to hear. That's really great. No, I appreciate that. It actually um, is interesting to me to think about. Um, one of the things I often communicate is these two prints that just came up, I actually are, I want to talk about them in terms of this is the learning experience. These two prints are based off of the same veteran story. So. If you don't mind, I'll indulge me since we're at this print right now. This print right here is done by an incredible artist who was a grad student at the time, a relief artist graphically. Um, we've since got some better prints since this was made, but at the time it was made graphically, it was one of the best prints that we had. This artist was invited to, um, it's based off of a female Marine, um, and I don't mean to categorize female or male, but it was for an all-female veteran exhibit. Marine that served in the 80s was an aerial reconnaissance photographer. Um, she invited the artist to her home, spent three hours, plus hours, um, shared a meal, great conversation, emailed me about 50 pictures. I sent them to the artist, provided all kinds of content. 
And this was an example of an artist taking their preconceived idea or notions of what they wanted to bring to the table and failed to capture the veteran experience. So uh, I still appreciate the artist and I love this body of work, but I use it as a teachable moment because the veteran was very, not upset, but disconnected from her own print. She felt, it's called um, esprit de corps because the Marine and the birthday cake represents the Marines are very gung-ho about their birthday. Right, so you all know that, right? So of course, that good point, he got it, check. The training was intense. He symbolized that with the gas mask, check. Um, the picture that Linda shared with us has her hair, red hair, short like that. Essentially, the woman in the gas mask, that looks like Linda, check. But like I said, she invited him to her home, spent three hours, talked about the fact that her and her husband met in the Marine Corps. Her husband also was a veteran. Um, it missed the point. Um, so it took like, I don't know, seven, that was done in 2012. Last year, she was willing to participate again and had an artist from the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design do her story. And rarely do I intervene and give like information before the print is made to the artist. I try not to like hinder it. But I did tell the artist the responsibility that they were charged with that told them the lesson. And I, I told them, no pressure. If it doesn't work and she doesn't like the print, no, no big deal. But can you just try to listen to her experience? Linda loves that print. Linda has had it framed. Her husband participated in the project as well. His print is framed and they're both in their house and she's really pleased with it. But that's kind of the struggle is real with that reintegration into civilian experience. He came to the table with this basic idea of what it means to be a Marine and also kind of put a political slant on it, um, which at the time I actually was asking the artist not to do. But, um, you know, I, I think it's a great print and um, it's a great teachable moment and it's a way to encourage others to maybe think about how we hear people's stories. It also is a way in which to tell veterans, think about how we're communicating our stories. Often, I, I'm a, I tell you, I'm a storyteller, right? And I can talk and talk and talk. Um, recently, Carthage College in Kenosha has been doing verbatim plays based off of oral histories. And a verbatim play is, they record your story or they take your essay and they make this like seamless play on all these different stories using the actual language of the person that's interviewed. So they've done my story twice, two different interviews. And the first time I went to this show watching somebody portray my story, I couldn't believe, and they did a really good job, but things that I thought, I told this story a little bit earlier today with letter writing, the tone that I was talking in, the voice that I was speaking in, I'm hearing myself in a certain way, thinking, um, and I don't wanna put a stigma on mental health or post-traumatic stress, but thinking I'm okay, and really thinking that because I'm telling these stories and I'm telling them very um, descriptively, that that means I'm okay, right? But then I saw these stories being portrayed and fed back to me, and I thought, that person should talk to somebody, right? Or um, one of the depictions was me, um, Coming back, I worked in. I was a professional stagehand, so I returned to the theater where I worked when I came back, and um, that was the story they depicted. And the way they depicted it was that my friends thought I was completely changed and a different person. And I remember sitting there going, "Is that how they saw me? Is that how, when I thought we were okay, is that how they saw me?" And so it offered me an opportunity to talk to my friends and ask them that question. You know, 10 years has gone by, I'm a different person now, and I'm able to actually see maybe my own behaviors and how they've changed, but also how I think I'm communicating a story and how others are absorbing it. Because I did ask, you know, other people that I had told that story to if that's how they felt that translation was. And a lot of people felt closer to the translation that was portrayed in the theater than what I saw. Um, so often it's a way for us to even look at and examine our own experiences and think about how we communicate with one another. Um, in the business world, that's kind of like something that's trained, right? When you're trying to communicate what your wants and needs, um, sometimes you have to try a different approach. Um, other times, stand your ground. Do, you know, 
speak your, be who you are. I don't want people to change their voice because they're afraid of how people are going to perceive them. Um, but you know, that's kind of the way it is, um, working with communities and getting people to share those conversations. So thanks, that makes me think about it differently. Did anybody see any prints that they were interested in knowing the stories? Lindsay, you want me to? I don't know how we are on time, so I don't want to. OK, so um, some of the prints from the current prints from the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design um, are turning out to be really wonderful treats for me. Um, these students, their professor, Rena Yoon, is really strict with them. Like, She's got them working their tails off. Um, producing prints. I do want to talk a little bit about the prints that were selected for here um, because we talked a little bit about the Escalette Permanent Collection um, and what that means and a lot of the prints that you selected, um, we mentioned, I mentioned this to, to them earlier today, um, they represent a lot of women artists. Um, they represent stories on, we did an exhibit in 2012 called Not at Ease, and it was 20 women veterans from Wisconsin um, met with 20 artists and shared their story. Um, Brittany Keeler, this artist right here, is now Minnesota-based, but she's, um, sorry, I pointed here. It's, uh, <laughs> she's here, no. Um, her, um, this is Nancy's story. We also did prints um, part, from part of a group called Wisconsin American GI Forum. The American GI Forum is a national veteran organization that was started in World War II by Dr. Garcia um, when a Mexican-American soldier lost his life in combat. Um, his family was from Texas, and his local town refused to um, bury him in the local cemetery. So uh, Dr. Garcia, who had worked with um, his community in Texas to really help the Mexican-American community get social justice and rights, um, made that his cause to help start um, assisting Mexican-American veterans and their family members, and he created the American GI Forum. The Wisconsin chapter agreed to give us um, their stories. Um, so we captured 12 uh, Latino veterans in 2012 for the uh, Milwaukee County Historical Society. And Nancy was one of the, I think she might have been the only female participant, Air Force veteran, but was really kind in sharing her story with us because it was not an easy story to share. Um, and Brittany, um, who is the artist, um, has participated multiple times in the project. She is a daughter of a veteran. So uh, she um, has a great interest in learning the stories, but to be able to interview a woman was something that was really special to her as well um, and used metaphor and abstraction and these really kind of like folkloric images to um, tell this woman's story. Um, it includes harassment and military sexual trauma. And she did it in a way that presented this really beautiful print that um, reflected the veteran's strength. But one of the things that we tell the artists, if you're gonna capture a traumatic moment, think about this. Are you gonna wanna stare at that every day, like in your living room, and hang that on your wall, right? We need a, um, just because a story is a good story or a descriptive story, is that the right story to capture? Sometimes that is the story you need to capture. But also, um, we have to remember that this one story doesn't um, define you as a person, right? So how you layer imagery onto it. Um, the, story, the story on the right screen, the le your left on the screen, it's called Five Dollars. It's interesting that I said that about trauma and that, that image came up. Um, Mike De La Cruz is another talented artist in Colorado. He interviewed a, a veteran that went to Afghanistan and she told a story about um, a local farmer that um, he had, he traded his daughter for a chicken and for five dollars. And so it was a really difficult story to share, but um, he, he created this really beautiful print and um, stood with the veterans side by side at the exhibition and um, talked the story through with her and, and actually had people 
an open conversation that was not judgmental, but like really reflected a greater experience that maybe we can't comprehend here in the United States. And it also placed that story about society being disconnected. We don't see the immediate effects of war and conflict on a daily basis. And so sometimes stories like that seem so horrific and so far away and even maybe distance in time and history, but they're present happening today. Um, that print has led me to investigate a little bit further about that experience because that was not the experience I had in Iraq. Um, and so, um, but there are women in Iraq that are, um, there's a current underground railroad for women in Iraq fleeing um, persecution. Um, and there's Yanar Mohammed is doing incredible work with women in Iraq to um, save them and we've used um, art practice with Jessica Putnam Phillips, who's an Air Force ceramic-based artist, to create installations to raise awareness about these programs and these realities happening around the world. So the artwork is connecting us to communities that we may never have been um, involved with. Um, sometimes the prints are beautiful, but the stories are a little too hard to absorb for the veterans to consider that a piece of artwork on their wall, but it doesn't it doesn't take away from the experience that they have. Um, it's been wonderful to have the conversations with all the participants after. Every time I receive the editions of prints, um, it's like Christmas. I open them up and I, I'm always blown away by what these artists can accomplish. But I'm even more blown away when I meet the veterans and I see them at the reveal. I mean, it. I'm an artist, so for me, it's a no-brainer. Like, there's this beautiful print, there's this beautiful piece of work, but if you're not connected to artwork in that way, and you see this piece of artwork on the wall, and people start asking you about it, I've seen veterans who wouldn't talk or don't talk to their family start telling stories, and their families can kind of be just participants taking up space and able to actually hear the veteran's experience for the first time because they don't feel comfortable talking to their family, but because they were able to tell an artist, the families are able to actually hear some of these stories for the first time. And it, it bridges a little bit of a gap for them. Um, that doesn't always happen, but it has happened quite frequently. We have one print that I didn't put up in here um, in Colorado. Uh, it, a veteran I got contacted was interviewing, uh, an artist was interviewing a veteran who had served like 30 years in the military and they had just retired and they worked in a job that was so classified that they were not, and this is one of those stories that sounds like, you know, it's out of a Tom Clancy novel or something, but um, we, I got contacted because the veteran informed his instructors, this 18 year old young kid in community college. Um, for the first time, some of the work that the veteran had done was becoming declassified. So this was the first time he was able to actually tell his stories. And some of the stories, he couldn't even tell his wife or his child. So he would go to work all day and come home and not be able to talk about anything he did. And at one point in his service, he actually, I don't know what he did for a living, but something that day um, happened and he died. He flatlined, um, was actually pronounced dead at one point, and they revived him. And he survived, and he stayed in kind of um, coming to for the rest of the afternoon. And that night, they sent him home. And he was not allowed to tell his wife or his daughter that he died that day. And that sat with him for 30 years. Um, and so this information had become declassified, and that was the story. He decided to tell his 18-year-old artists in community college and um, it was really a good moment in the sense that I knew I had to be prepared to answer those questions, right? And what I told the artists is when they contacted me, um, we're not therapists and please don't try to be one. Um, the Veteran Resource Center at the college, at the university, we had ample resources to provide this veteran, so we, we paired him with the necessary resources to be able to share his stories. And the artist, thank goodness, was a, a really well-rounded um, guy, and he said, you know, 
My mom always told me I have two ears and one mouth for a reason. So he listened to the veteran's story and he put it on paper and it's this really simple black and white image of the back of a male veteran and looks like he's in a class A uniform, so your dress uniform, and he's holding the hand of a little girl, like three or four years old, and she's got a teddy bear. And then on the back wall it says, for those who served in silence, we thank you. And I remember I saw the print and I was like, oh, that's nice, you know, it's simple, it's good. I kind of had a, eh, it's okay, but I understand this was a heavy topic. My dad, was in New Mexico, he's from New Mexico. He met me in Colorado for this exhibit and um, I showed him the print. And he looked at it and he goes, and my father was in the army. And he said, oh, that's the NSA building, the National Security um, Agency. And I said, there is no building in this print. What are you, how do you know that's the NSA building? He said, on the wall of the entry corridor of the NSA building in marble, is etched the words, for those who serve in silence, we thank you. My father, I knew a little bit about my father's military experience. I didn't know. My father was military intelligence um, who served during Vietnam era. And I learned a lot about my father's experience that I had no idea about from that print at a village inn in the middle of Colorado. And I was kind of shocked at what I learned just because of that print. So sometimes the simplest imagery, we may not understand it, but somebody else might. And um, it led to my dad telling me one story about his experience, then I tell him something about mine that he didn't wanna hear, and then we kinda did this back and forth, and it was a really interesting exchange. So I'm grateful to a lot of these prints. Um, this is, um, this isn't Sherry Swakorsky, this is um, Kim, uh, Kim is actually was one of the first electro engi electromagnetic engineers in the Navy, first female in her field, advanced really rapidly, served uh, just, I think she just retired as getting her PhD, um, and it created Veterans for Diversity, um, an LGBTQ organization in Milwaukee, um, and runs it, is really incredible. Um, President Tank is uh, John Adams, he's a, uh, Army veteran, he and his wife have dedicated their lives to service. Um, he worked for the government after the Army, um, and in their retirement, they run the Honor Flight Program in Milwaukee, and every single veteran activity in Wisconsin, you'll see John and Cheryl participating. Um, I will have this print framed and put in my house. John just, um, he got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and has 18 months, so. Um, an incredible, it will be an incredible loss for the veteran community in Wisconsin, um, but a life force. Um, this is Patrick, uh, Patrick's print. Uh, the, Linda, who was the Marine veteran, her husband in the Marine, this is his print that um, the artist created. And it, ha it ha talks about motorcycles and his love of motorcycles. This artist really got it. Like he was like, oh, Linda thought, oh, it didn't say anything. And Patrick loves it. Oh, I love motorcycles. I told him about this map and I told him about this and so. Um, what's interesting to me is some of these artists are like 18, 19 years old, and they do have a choice whether or not they could serve or not. And none of, some of them, like Tyler, his quote said, he really never had a desire to join the military, so it's a curious thing for him to think about the military experience and why somebody would volunteer to do this. Um, doesn't come from a military background. This print here on the right, on the right of the screen, this is um, Anna, this woman, um, her and her husband just participated in the project. She went to basic training with me. Um, when it was from Milwaukee. I'm not from Wisconsin. I've relocated there 10 years ago um, and found out after she got out of the military, her and her husband now live in Milwaukee again. Um, so I haven't seen her since 2002 and I still have her print, I need to get back to her, but so we're gonna have a nice like 18 year reunion when I get her. She participated in the print project and we met 18 years ago. So there's some reconnections in here. Um, Jesse Albrecht, I mentioned earlier, another veteran artist. Um, the world is a small place. Um, he's an artist based out of Montana. He's from Wisconsin. Um, but we did a panel discussion in California a few years ago to talk about the Veteran Print Project and his work in ceramics. And we were out 
um, having a conversation after the panel, and he, you know, we were, I was talking about painting murals in Iraq, and he just said confidently, I know. I thought, well, I know I like to talk, but how do you know that I painted these murals? He said, I was in Iraq with you in Mosul, and I talked to you when you were painting these murals all the time. He wasn't in my unit, so he was a medic. Um, and we had this amazing moment where I'm like, I felt really guilty that I didn't know who he was. But like I said, I met like hundreds of people on a daily basis. Um, and it, it, I won't tell you the story of what, what happened with his tattoo because it's probably irrelevant. But um, this world connects us in odd ways. And he is doing some incredible artwork um, in Montana. And he works with the Station Foundation. I introduced him to an organization out there that works with um, special Forces veterans who, Special Forces, um, Navy SEALs, who leave the military because they decide to choose family over the military because of that job requires them to be gone at a moment's notice. You can't tell your family where you're at. You can't explain your experience. And you also, they have a really hard time reacclimating because it's a very adrenaline filled job. And so the Station Foundation brings the family out to Montana and teaches the family about some of these skills that the veterans love, hiking, endurance, running, um, some of the things that make them thrive and helps answer the question why they were willing to like leave home and do these things. It gives them a taste of what they love and it re returns the veteran to some of these things that their family loves. So it's a really great program and Jesse does printmaking with them there because I was unable to be in Montana, Jesse was. Um, do you have any questions on Prince? Um, trying to think of others that have, um, this is another example of the AJIF veterans. Lupe, I don't know if you can see it on there, the white on the side. It's a beautiful print that you can only see it in certain lights. On the left, it's his basic training photo and on the right, it's the mirror image of that photo, but he's got his purple heart. Um, so it's kind of a ghost of his former self, but with an additional medal on his chest. Um, and Lupe's family was in uh, the pictures of the community pictures. His entire family came to the exhibit and took a photo with the print. Um, this print on the Left here is one of the veterans from the Station Foundation. So this is based off of a Special Forces veteran. Um, and those, those stories are completely anonymous. We agreed to do the print project and allow them to be completely anonymous and only talk about the artwork. So, um, but he is um, a participant from the Station Foundation. And Elizabeth Dove did that print, and uh, extremely talented. She sent me, so that print's about nine layers. You wouldn't be able to tell. Um, she sent me all of her a proof from each layer. So as the, um, there's a substrate that you create your work on. And as each color layer goes through, she sent me a printed proof of what that looked like and on all of the processes she did. So I can use that as a learning tool. Um, We've worked with a lot of professors from different universities around the country, um, art students, and our artists are, range from um, well-established professional printmakers all the way down to the first year semester printmaking artist. Um, this print I love because it is actually the water rings that the Osprey helicopter caused causes as it comes off the deck. Um, so through abstraction, she was really able to capture this really um, intense experience. So it was the, the rings and then kind of that whirlpool that happens. Um, and a lot of these artists have to do research. I mean, the military language is a completely different language. Um, a lot of these jobs people didn't even know existed. This is a print we talked about earlier today. This is Laura Grosset's um, print on Matthew's story, and each of those flowers represents a different fauna, floral fauna, from each of the places he served around the world, because that's what he was studying at Colorado State, and he loved writing letters home, so 
there's this picture of an envelope. And I recreated that on stationery, and it, it says correspondence on it. We use it for the print project to fundraise. Um, different methodologies. This is screen printed on like muslin. Um, so some of the artists can get really, I think part of it's spray painted too, get really creative. That one's really kind of hard to store. <laughs> this is the one I was telling you about. Uh, the artist, the veteran, this is mine. Um, he was studying chemistry, so there's little details you can't really see. There's little chemical elements etched inside the water. Um, but he loved Greek mythology, so this is called Odysseus in the Toolbox. And um, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Hakusai, Japanese woodblock prints, the big waves. So I love Hakusai, um, and I think everybody at some point wants to do the Hakusai waves in their work. But um, he, Ian is his name. Um, we shared this long phone conversation one night, and he was in Colorado, I was in Wisconsin, and. I was having a hard time getting him to be descriptive. I mean, he's a chemistry major, he was in the Navy, he just kind of was giving me his basic rundown and we were toward the end of the conversation and I said, I've never been on a ship. Um, I'm very unfamiliar with naval tactics, the existence of being on a ship. I would imagine were there ever any storms that you experienced and he said, absolutely. Um, there were storms quite frequently. Um, and when the storms happen, um, the, the type of ship he was on, and I'm gonna get it incorrect, um, it had Harriers on it. So um, as Andrew this afternoon was talking about Harriers, but um, anyway, the, the ship itself all along it, so planes are all up and down the side of, on top of the ship, and the Harrier, Harriers, they, the wings fold back so that all the planes can be lined up side by side. It's really kind of cool. Um, but when the storms come, everybody has to go below deck and you can't, you know, everything has to be fastened up on and secured on top. And he realized that he left the toolbox on deck and everybody was standing there. We have to secure that. We can't lose that. And uh, he was like, well, I love Odysseus. Odysseus would go get the toolbox. So he's like, okay. So he runs up, he gets the toolbox, there's lightning everywhere, there's a metal chain on a metal toolbox with metal hinges, and he, he drags it back. Um, so that was my Odysseus in the toolbox. Um, and Ian loves this print, I love this print, this is one of my favorite prints. Um, it also is um, from my first semester of etching, um, and our professor, was very strict, she's a very well-known artist, and when Francis died, it was a little tough for us, but um, she made us do every type of methodology in etching on one plate, which is absurd if you're you know, etching, so we had, to, we had to dip it in acid and do what's called dry point, and we had to do marbling, and so I don't know why I chose to do this print for that, but every time I thought I was close to getting it where it needed to be, she would tell me to do something else with it. And I'm grateful because the original print was really this really kind of just simple line drawing. Um, and it has so much more body because of somebody saying, do more, do more, do more. So this is a print that I talk to people about that is really simple and graphic and most people are like, oh, a scorpion. But if you've, anybody that served in Iraq or has served in even California, um, the idea of the scorpion is a really uh, definitive experience. Um, we're bored a lot in Iraq, so we would have scorpion camel spider battles and <laughs> people would collect scorpions and so this is a, a, a scorpion actually stinging himself um, because the soldiers would wonder if a scorpion stung himself, would it, would it hurt himself? Um, no, it was fine. But a camel spider kept stinging the scorpion. I, but it was one of these that I laughed as soon as I saw this image and really, unless you were there, you don't really get it, but I love this image. 
Well, I don't want to keep you guys, but I, I'm I'm really grateful for being here. I hope that this was gave you some information about the Veteran Print Project. I know you guys aren't all artists, so I hope I didn't go on with too much uh, art, um, you know, love of art, self-indulgent love of art. But <laughs> so thank you and thank you again. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to share it with the world, and it's better to be seen than in archival drawers somewhere. So, thank you. Um, and you guys are here from the. Uh, is it the class on war and memory? No, class on race and Ooh. Okay. Yeah, I was jealous. I said, "Is that an online program?" <laughs> <laughs> Sign me up. Um, Well, I'm curious. We, uh, we, I was a curatorial fellow last year for the National Veteran Art Museum Triennial, and a part of that was teaching a museum studies class at University of Chicago, Illinois. Um, and so we were teaching cur curatorial students about on war and survival and reintegration. And so each Monday we would meet with this class, and none of these students were veterans. And so it was really interesting for me to hear how war and conflict is being discussed from a non-veteran perspective um, in good and bad. I mean, there were questions that I thought, wow, I, I didn't expect that. You know, I had my own preconceived notions of what people are asking about the war, but um, starting to really do some research on the art history and the World War I history, examining conflict through a historic lens is difficult sometimes when you're a veteran. Like the more I learn, the more frustrated I get about my experience. But the more I'm grateful to have a better, broader view of what that experience was. Um, That's amazing. Those are some of the ties that really we can see in each class that we get to see. We get to have an Alpaca class last year, and I had a lot of Alpaca shows and a veteran. Mm -hmm. And then there's somebody who was just at this one, an undergraduate who was a veteran, and she said, I love every veteran. Wow. So, you know, they were just there. Yeah. So it's, it's nice to have different perspectives. I'm curious on the war and race. Um, are you looking at the racial experience both as military or also of the communities in which Both. conflict is existing in? So we are focusing, because I'm, I'm a U.S. soldier first and uh -huh. foremost, we're looking at the collective complexity. Okay. And we are reading um, books and articles and kind of running the gamut. So we are reading about Vietnam. Right. Wow. Well, it's, it's, I really do wish I could be here and participate in every, I would, I'd sign up to, today. Um, um, right, I know. Well, you know, you, ne you never know, but um, that is the one thing I am grateful for, these, this group of emerging veteran artists. They challenge me on a daily basis because I find myself struggling sometimes to work through some of these topics. Um, but then when I step back and I allow myself to kind of do an out-of-body experience and or go back to the, the mindset that I was in when I was serving, because when I was serving, I was, I don't know how, to, how else to put it, I was the person in my unit that was calling people out for these behaviors that they were unaware that they were doing, or they were very aware that they were doing, um, but not really, 
understanding at the time while I was serving that some of these experiences or things that I was seeing were very race-based. Um, I wasn't, I think, aware enough in my own existence to be seeing that as race. Growing up in New Mexico, everybody looked like me. And then when I was in the military, that was the most diverse experience I've ever had in my life. And it was eye-opening to the way in which I thought I was raised and seeing that people have such a, a different experience and learning that. Um, but you'd think that in some ways, by the time we all are um, fully trained that we, you get trained to work together as this unit, right? So in theory, it, it seems like the biggest social experiment that this melting pot would come together for a mission, get the mission accomplished, you're not gonna have those tensions. And the reality is, is that there's, they're still very fighting. And they're still very, um, things can, we, we're almost self-segregated now. Um, but it's interesting for me from an oral history point of view to hear oral histories from veterans of all generations. And sometimes it's sad to realize that the story, the narrative doesn't change. Like you could take out the time of service or the branch of service or the gender out of it and just read a transcript. And you could read a transcript from yesterday and compare it to somebody from World War I and sadly sometimes the narrative is like almost verbatim, word for word. Um, and sometimes those realizations are really difficult for me, like I'm processing it. It's like, wow, they sound just like me. And then it's, oh no, they sound just like me. Um, we're just kind of repeating this, this existence. But um, the emerging veteran artists work with, they do a lot of work with Iraqi artists and Iraqi communities. And I was really close to my Iraqi workers when I was in, in Iraq, and so much so I got in trouble for being too close with them. But um, they're really able to examine how our country is communicating the war and to give a little bit of a voice to who apparently is the enemy, right? And it's a little bit more difficult with the Afghanistan conflict, um, but I don't have a lot of experience to speak from on that, but I know that there's a little bit different tension in that area. Um, but it just, it seems so important to me to talk about that dynamic. I was telling a story called Rachel earlier today. It's a Vietnam veteran I interviewed. And he, when I interviewed him, he was at the very last stages of Parkinson's, advanced Parkinson's. So we had to go in, we had to take our time with his interview um, because it was really exhausting. And the end of our first day, I was, I'd seen that he was getting tired. And so I said, oh, maybe we should wrap this up for today. And he said, yeah, we'll wrap it up. And so before we turn off the recorder, is there anything you want to wrap up and mention today? And just kind of like nonchalantly, he says, oh, remind me when we talk next to tell you about what they did to the black soldiers in Martin Luther King with assassinations. And I said, are you sure, are you, sure you want to stop right now, Paul? Like, are you going to be able to remember to get us back to that point? I know you're really tired. He said, no, I have to talk. And I stopped the recording, and he said, like, another, like, two minutes worth of stuff. And I said, just hold on to that, Paul. And so the next time I started recording him the next day, he kind of was just not really in that same sort of mindset. We were talking about the he was in Des Moines doing the Tet Offensive. And I, I was doing a lot of research on the Tet Offensive to get his print so I understood what he was talking about. And it was really interesting to me, the wave of the Tet Offensive coincided with the wave of the assassinations last year with um, John F. JFK, then um, Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr. And he, he basically said that when Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, they gathered up all the black veterans and 
separated them in, in a sense, almost like detained them for fear of rioting and everybody else was kind of given like a warning or telling them, but no, no effort was made to really gather them as in, to unify. And instead they took these very like offensive measures with the black veterans. And Paul was, uh, he's a white man from Wisconsin. And so he was telling this story, but it, and I, you know, I can't say what he was feeling and, and I don't know how much of his tone was based off of his condition too, but it was really nonchalant from him um, in a way that I couldn't tell if he wanted to make sure that people knew what happened or what his perspective was on it. Um, but those are some of the interesting conversations that I find in oral history you have people that will be like, oh yeah, and then that happened. And they don't even realize what a monumental experience that was or what that says about um, mission readiness and experiences and perspectives. I'm sure if you interview the black veteran from Da Nang, that story would be very different. It would be very different. Um, I, I would love, I'll, I'll be reading up on your program more and be loved, I'd love to hear some of the reading lists just to, you know, and read. That would be great. Um, Aaron Hughes in Chicago just part of the triennial, one of the exhibits was veterans and social justice movements um, from World War One to present. So a lot of um, organizations that were created. Um, thank you very much um, from social justice movements over the last hundred years. Like AGIF, unfortunately, wasn't part of that, but AGIF is one of the organizations that I work with. Yeah, no, um, I really Yeah. Thank you. Let me give you my card too. Well, thank you and thank you. I know some. I think you brought some of your students. Yeah, yeah. Small class. Small class. Everybody said yes. Okay. Um, he works on the brain cell contract. He's not on the state department of health issue, but brain cell contract. And every every Marine Corps birthday, she called her stepfather. And, Happy birthday! <laughs> Yay! Some love you. you know, to this day, it doesn't. <laughs> I had a I had a boss at a veteran organization, and it was a coffee shop, and um, the the password for one of the things was the Marine Corps birthday. Did so you it was know like. The Marine Corps yeah, it was like my first day of work. I was like, I don't know what the Marine Corps birthday is like. I'm like, I was Army, sorry. That was super interesting. Oh, thank I thank you. you for coming and also being willing to part with as many prints as you did. Oh, no, I am I am pleased. They, they have selected a lot of my very favorites. And there were some I actually wished I could offer, but I only had limited number in my edition. So I was like, you can't have that one. Well, you know, maybe in my will, I'll just will the rest of them to Chapman. 